I'm Samir Singhal. I'm a director of biomedical energy technologies here in Huntsville, Alabama at CFD Research Corporation. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out to hear me talk. As uh, Amy hinted at, um, I'm really here to talk to you about a new battery technology, something we call the biobattery. Um, and I've labeled it research at the intersection between bio, energy, and defense. And that really applies to the researchers working on the technology and the application of the technology. So I'll start with a question. How many people in this room have one of these devices, you know, a cell phone, an iPhone, smartphone, anything? You know, I think pretty much everyone's hand is in the air. And the question I probably should have asked is who doesn't have one of these devices? Uh, there's actually a statistic now that there's more cell phones and smartphones in the world than there are people today. So the next question I have is, um, what do you think these devices run on? So it's kind of a common misconception. I think you know, the answer most of you are probably thinking in your head is one of these, a battery. Um, in reality, what these devices run on is chargers, a whole bunch of chargers and then plugs, you know, wall outlets, the grid. So you have to have plugs, you have to have chargers, you have to have outlets to use these technologies. And as you probably noticed, you keep getting a fancier and fancier cell phone with all these GPSs, cameras, and what's happening is that your cell phone is lasting less and less long, so you can't even use it for 24 hours without having to recharge it. So there's actually a documented fear. It's, you know, it's literally a psychological fear in America today called range anxiety. And it's the fear that you're going to run out of power <laughs> to your devices. <laughs> And this is really bad, like when you're in the airport, you know, I travel a lot and you're always looking for that plug, you're trying to power up your laptop before you get on the plane, you're trying to keep your cell phone charged so that when you land you can call somebody and tell them to pick you up. Um, and this is nice, you know, now they've started putting these nice fancy plugs in the airport for you. Five or six years ago you would see all these guys in suits and ties sitting on the floor near that plug trying to uh, keep their laptop going. So our solution is the bio battery. Now this is an enzyme catalyzed fuel cell, so we use enzymes and renewable microorganisms as catalysts instead of platinum or palladium. So instead of using rare earth metals, we use these biological um, species as catalysts and we're able to break down renewable fuels and convert them directly into electrical energy. So it is a biomimetic process, um, you know, taking inspiration from nature, which I think really is the best way to, um, to invent and to do science. So the fuel source for a battery, it's literally the same thing that this hummingbird runs on. It runs on sugar water. So we have a battery that runs on sugar water, just like humans, just like animals. Um, and as I said, biomimetic process. So just briefly, that top left picture kind of shows you a traditional battery. What we've done is we've taken the metal catalysts off the battery and we've replaced them with enzymes. Um, these enzymes can convert sugar and other fuels directly into energy. Uh, this graph on the bottom right, we've been working on this for about four years now, and that's kind of showing the increase in power and energy density over those four or five years. So we've increased the power about 100x in four years, and we're still going. So we think this technology has the potential to significantly um, surpass that of today's batteries while being safer and more environmentally friendly and using renewable catalysts and renewable fuels. So how it works, you know, I kind of got into this a little bit. In the top left there, you just see a petri dish. Literally, you can grow bacteria, grow E. coli organisms, and you can extract the enzymes from those organisms. So you don't have to go mining platinum or palladium or any rare earth metals as a catalyst from your battery. Um, you know, very easy test tube based process. You take those enzymes and you immobilize them on the electrode. Um, we use a, a mixture of carbon based materials to get the enzymes to stick to the electrode of the battery. And then you just stick it in this simple hardware. This is just you know, some plastic hardware that we developed um, over here, and then you can test your device and, you know, put out watts and watts of power. So the advantages, high energy density. As I mentioned, sugar is nice because it's a renewable fuel, but it's also got a tremendous amount of energy in it. We've, we have the potential to get 5,000 watt hours per kilogram of energy, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute. Um, the high energy density will lead to smaller batteries, lighter weight batteries. The other big advantage is the readily available fuel. Uh, you know, fuel cells are becoming more and more popular today, but they run on things like hydrogen, methanol, things you can't get in your corner grocery store. Our technology runs on sugar. You know, you can use Gatorade, you can use Coke, you can use the sugar package you find at a restaurant, and you can power your devices with that. So anywhere in the world you can get access to the fuel to run your device. Uh, we also use renewable biocatalysts. So as I mentioned, we have the enzymes instead of the uh, rare earth metals like the platinum or palladium. Um, another statistic I've heard is that if fuel cell technology really takes off, the traditional fuel cell technology, there won't be enough platinum to, uh, to build all the fuel cells people want. So, you know, again, here's a process where you can just grow these organisms, extract the enzymes, and you have an unlimited supply of catalyst. 
So talking about energy density specifically, this top left picture here is traditional batteries. You know, you've got a double-A battery. Everyone's seen that. You've got the battery that you put in your laptop there. Those batteries have energy densities of, you know, between 100 and 250 watt hours per kilogram. And the way you recharge those batteries when they run out of power is you use these plugs and you're tethered to a wall for two, three, four hours at a time. Our technology, the bio battery, has the potential just on sugar water to have 2,500 watt hours per gram. So now you're talking about 10 times the power density of that laptop battery. So now your technology can run 10 times longer. You know, instead of that cell phone lasting one day, it could last six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days. Um, the other advantage is when you do run out of power, you simply fill up our bio battery with fuel, with sugar water, and then your device is ready to go again. You can take this this charger, this bio battery with you on the plane, you know, it's not like a, the grid or the wall outlet where you can't take it with you. And that's just one fuel, you know. We actually have other fuels we're looking at, like alcohols and, and diesel fuel, where the energy density is 5,000 or even 10,000 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, just, you know, lithium ion is pretty much the dominant technology in today's devices. Everyone's cell phone camera uses lithium ion uh, batteries right now. The theoretical energy density for lithium ion is 700 watt hours per kilogram. So all this research, all the engineering you're seeing, it's never going to get better than 700 watt hours per kilogram. Um, our technology has the potential for 2,500 with sugar, and as I mentioned, even all the way up to 10,000 watt hours per kilogram. So not only is it environmentally friendly, not only is it run on safe fuels, but it's got the potential, which is what really people care about, is for tremendously more energy density. The other big advantage is fuel flexibility. So there's a number of different fuels here, and we've run, you know, all these fuels in the blue arrows, we've run our battery on all of these fuels. You know, we've got just sugar here, table sugar. Um, you've got alcohol in that picture there. Uh, we've got fuels like Gatorade and Coke. You know, you can take these fuels and buffer them and put them in our battery and use them directly. And then, you know, really leveraging on the biomimicry, we've got blood. You can literally use blood and the sugar in the bloodstream to generate energy. And then you have the potential down here for other fuels too, like ethanol, E85 that you see at the gas station, um, JP8, which is a big military jet fuel, and then just diesel fuel, again, coming from the pump. That's stuff that we're working on right now. So again, getting back to the energy density, just to, to put it in terms that people understand, this, this one can of Coke that you, know, you can buy at any corner grocery store or drugstore has the same energy as 72 AA batteries. So I'll say that again, one can of Coke you know, that you can get anywhere in the world has as much power as 72 AA batteries. Um, these 72 AA batteries have, they weigh about four pounds, and you know, that can of Coke has about 13 grams of sugar in it. So how can this benefit people? We think it can benefit almost you know, a wide variety of people from the, um, the backpacker, you know, people camping or out in remote, remote locations over the weekend or for multiple days at a time. Um, it can, help people who don't have access to the grid, people in remote villages, you know, in the African villages in South America, and then, you know, it can help our warfighter, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. So this is a picture of a warfighter on a 72-hour mission. This is just the portable devices he carries, so just the devices that run off AA batteries. So he's got night vision goggles there, a flashlight, um, GPS unit, uh, some kind of, you know, communication system. And just for 24 hours, he needs 44 AA batteries. Uh, the GPS unit alone takes 24 AA batteries to run that GPS unit. So, you know, we, we keep inventing these new devices, and they're making our lives easier, and they're making it better for the soldier, but we're not inventing the commensurate battery technology to power these devices. So now the soldier's carrying, people say they carry upwards of 20 pounds of batteries in their backpack, um, even outweighing the amount of ammunition they carry with them. And this is just the portable batteries. And if you look at this slide, this is about a 20-person um, you know, troop uh, battalion, and you can see they have 1,400 batteries there, about 400 pounds of batteries. Uh, these different colors here represent the different batteries, everything from 9 volts, the double A's, the triple A's, and then they have these uh, two-pound batteries, look like a brick called a 2590 that they used to power their communications, their radios. They'll carry up to nine of those. So that's nine two-pound batteries on your backpack, just because you've got to make sure you have your radio working and your communication. So it's a very big deal how you recharge these devices. So how do they do that now? They use diesel generators or they use Humvees. Um, big problem with those is that they're not portable. They're very loud and they require diesel fuel. Um, you guys have probably heard about the extremely high cost of getting diesel fuel to forward combat zones. People say it costs upwards of $30 a gallon to deliver diesel fuel in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you've probably also heard even more disturbing is the um, amount of fatalities related to the fuel convoys. Some of the largest fatalities in the current wars are the fuel convoys getting attacked. 
Um, and this is all, you know, to supply the diesel fuel that's used to recharge these devices and these batteries. Um, a new solution, renewable energy solution, which I really like and which the soldiers really like, is these flexible solar panels. They roll them up, they put them in their backpack, uh, they unroll them, and then they use them to charge their batteries. The problem with this solution is it only works about 20% of the time. It doesn't work at night, it doesn't work when it's raining, it doesn't work when you're undercover. And, you know, that's in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. If you start talking about you know, other combat zones and rainforests and in South America, the availability is going to be even worse. So they do need another solution to recharge batteries silently without giving away their situational position and at night. So that's our solution, you know, using our bio battery, plugging it into your smartphone, uh, letting the soldier plug it into his devices and using it to, uh, to recharge and keep running when you're away from the grid. So another idea I'm going to talk to you about right here to end is Air Force Research Labs has these MAVs, these micro-air vehicles. Um, people refer to them as drones. You've probably heard a lot about them. Uh, they're, they're used for re reconnaissance, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, essentially, for monitoring situations. So this picture right here is a WASP-3 um, MAV. That's the current MAV that they're using um, in combat zones. This is the vision for 2015. It's a biomimetic concept, so imitating a bird, making the MAV look like a bird. And then all the way out here in 2030, you know, about 20 years from now, they want to have an insect-based device, so basically an MAV that looks like an insect. So we took this idea and we were like, let's go a step further. We actually miniaturized our fuel cell, and here's a you know, green plastic fuel cell the size of a penny or even smaller, completely biocompatible. And we work with scientists at the University of California at Berkeley, and we implanted this fuel cell inside a live beetle. So this is a live beetle we implanted the fuel cell, and we were able to generate energy from the sugar in the insect's bloodstream. And this graph here is showing, you know, this red line is the energy right after we implanted it. And then uh, the blue line is after two weeks. So after two weeks of um, having the implantation, the insect is not only still alive, not only still flying around, but he's still generating energy. So you can see the tremendous potential in this, um, in this demonstration. So in this specific application, we're trying to take the insect, turn him into a microaerial vehicle um, for the military, and you can mount cameras or sensors on the on the bug and have him uh, do reconnaissance for you. So I have a, a video actually <laughs> that you guys might like. So this is a video that was taken with our collaborators of the University of California in Berkeley and they've actually implanted neural stimulators into the bug and you can hear we're actually controlling the way the wing beats his, um, beats his wings, the wing flap of the insect by stir, uh, stimulating them and it's very low voltage, a couple of tenths of a uh, of volts and you can stimulate the insect. And you'll see here as he changes the frequency of the stimulation, you can hear the way the insect beats his wings is changing. Now the real reason for this is we're not just looking at um, maximizing power generation, we're looking at minimizing power consumption. So one of the biggest problems with MAVs is that the Bluetooth communication uses a lot of power. So we're thinking, can you actually use the insect's native calling ability basically modulate the way he flaps his wing, and then you can have a, a big microphone back at base camp that can detect that. And you can essentially turn him into a, a binary signal, a zero or one, you know, he's flapping at 50 hertz, if nothing is wrong, if something is wrong, he starts flapping at 100 hertz. You can pick that back up at base camp. So these guys at University of California at Berkeley have been doing this for quite a while, so we leverage their expertise to, to implant a bio battery and to generate energy from this insect. So we kind of see four applications. There's portable charging, I've talked to you guys a lot, um, cell phone, soldier power. There's disaster relief. Anybody who was here in Huntsville last year, you know, on April 27th, remembers the tornadoes, and we didn't have power for about five, five days. It was very hard to charge a cell phone to stay in contact with the world. Um, so that's a big application, we think. Um, replacing batteries, toys and greeting cards I haven't talked about yet, but there was actually a story just last week on ABC News on August 30th about all the uh, injuries and deaths related to uh, kids swallowing greeting cards and coin cell batteries. So there's been over 50,000 injuries in the last 15 years, kids being injured by swallowing these batteries. And there's been about 15 deaths. And the more alarming part is in the last two years, this has gone up significantly. Um, and then you've got medical implants, so pacemakers, um, insulin pumps. Again, getting to the biomimetic aspect, you know, you can take the blood, the sugar in your bloodstream, and you can have a pacemaker that lasts forever. Right now, a pacemaker battery lasts about 10 years and then you have to um, have surgery to get the pacemaker replaced. We think by implanting a bio battery, you can live off the sugar in the bloodstream, which is already being replaced, and you can have a pacemaker that lasts forever. So that's essentially our idea worth spreading. Um, thank you all for your time today, and I'll be available later on.